Ladies and gentlemen of Design Shanghai, good morning, good afternoon, whatever time it is in Shanghai, I'm really not sure. Um, I, I'm here in London, my name is Aidan Walker. It is my pleasure and delight to be the um, program director of the Design Shanghai Forum and indeed Design China Beijing, which is in September, and Design Shenzhen, our new launch, which is happening in December. Um, because we can't fly, because as everybody knows, we can't fly our international speakers into China right now, um, it's given me a whole new part of experience of um, speaking to the, p the people that I would love to come and present uh, in China and put them on video. So that means that, uh, that you can see the film here where you are now sitting uh, in the Shanghai Exhibition Center and also online and indeed um, and all sorts of other um, places where that film will be visible. So this morning, which is now here we are in London, I'm sitting in um, a garden pavilion, a small garden pavilion, I suppose you could call it, um, in the, uh, uh, behind an elegant uh, Regency house in the center of London with Anna Liu and Mike Tonkin of Tonkin Liu, who are architects, I would like to call them architects of poetry. There's something very, very beautiful, very, very uplifting about their work. Uh, they are profoundly inspired by nature. Uh, they are heavily committed to the idea of regenerative or restorative design, which is a, an underlying theme not only for Design Shanghai this year, but also um, the other two forums we have in Beijing and Shenzhen. And um, they have also done work in China, uh, they've got projects, some of them built, some of them unbuilt. Um, but there are, there are two major themes that I'd like us to discuss before we talk about their actual projects. They've chosen some projects for us to talk about. And that is where it all started, where their relationship with nature um, came from and what it means. And also um, the relationship with language, the relationship with words. Uh, I've just been talking to them before we started filming. I'm a words guy, you know, so I very much respond to, to poetry and that's why looking at their work there's something poetic I can see in, in the beauty of what they do. Uh, and then they have four things called asking, looking, playing and making, which is part of their process. So, Mike, maybe you can start. What about nature? What was it? Was it the sand between your toes? Um, growing up in the West Country in England, um, Grew up in a uh, outside of Bath, a village, and we were sort of in the fields. So just grew up in trees and learned about structure by falling out of them. <laughs> and um, and um, so I think nature was always a kind of pivotal thing. And maybe storytelling also came out of that um, somehow. I don't know. Growing up in a sort of rural community, and the other thing is um, growing up next to Bath, this beautiful classical city. Yes. Uh, I think. Um, that's also very much about nature. It's a, it's a beautiful city where uh, the countryside comes into the city centre and this beautiful, elegant, classical architecture kind of um, is all about that integration of nature into the city. I, I want to get us talking about storytelling because um, I, I think I probably mentioned in our notes that we were swapping before I came that um, it's something that designers and architects often talk about, almost always, you know, the, the whole idea of narrative. And I see that you're that your work is, that, you know, that words and storytelling are very much a part of your work, but I don't really know how. I mean, maybe we could get Anna to talk initially about her relationship with nature. You, you're from Taiwan, Anna, is that right? That's right. I was born in Taiwan. So that's so highly kind of a different from the West Country of Artificial England, right? <laughs> place, <laughs> uh, plastic capital of the uh, 60s, 70s. Yeah, so my relationship with nature was much more uncomfortable, maybe. Um, grew up in a kind of town, not surrounded by nature. Uh, so I was kind of loved and adored, in a way, the artifice. Uh, so it's only later on in life I be began this kind of exciting adventure into looking at nature, which is why I'm still really excited about it, because for me it's, it's quite new and I'm looking at it fresh as a a kind of quarry of form and system and inspiration, artistic inspiration. Mm. Um, so maybe at first it was a kind of unease, uh, and then I moved to America, uh, but continued to be slightly detached from nature. 
uh, lived in New York City. Um, yeah, so nature is a recent discovery, I suppose. Did it, did, I mean, for, for Mike, for falling out of trees, yeah. did a fascination or your relationship with nature come before your interest in structure and designing and building? How, how I think they were kind of related because I was in the tree to build a den. Oh, okay. So I think it was an architect. It was always an architectural project. Right. And one den I built out of plasterboard, and it rained, and I went into my den, yeah. and of course I fell out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. because it has no strength. Which I didn't know. You know. Yeah, well, <laughs> you that, right? Exactly. Yeah. The hard way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, uh, uh, Anna, what about the? What I'm trying to get at is how this drew you or drove you both into architecture, into designing and making place you know buildings things for people yeah. how did how did it how did it happen i realized i suppose when i discovered architecture which is in my 20s um in in japan i realized certain spaces are so um so so strong has such strong character and it came from not just the building but what's around it and, and the elements and that was a kind of a, a discovery of architecture and nature at the same time. But I couldn't quite articulate it, I don't think. Mm -hmm. So it was always sort of intuitive. And I think human beings have always um, had this uh, interest in, and maybe slight fear of nature. And, you know, I suppose you can say we eventually tried to dominate it. Mm -hmm. And now we're in a different kind of relationship, which is to do with more of a collaboration. So I think that's quite interesting collaboration with nature yeah. are we i mean i you know for for sure the whole dominant thing and i mean that's kind of got us to where we are hasn't it got us to yeah. the to the you know terrible ghastly situation we're in but um one of the ways that i was beginning to understand your work as i was doing my my research into it before i came was was inspiration if you're talking about collaboration with nature mm -hmm. I mean, say, for instance, take some of these forms and, mm -hmm. and patterns. Are you, you're drawing, are you not, from, from what nature we, shows you? We do see nature as a source of inspiration, um, but it's, it's more than that. It's also a sort of, um, it's a harboring device for kind of a philosophical well-being, because I think we all have this relationship with nature deep in our primal being, yeah. and actually that makes people feel good. Yeah. And you only need to, when we were in Hong Kong, we used to we lived there for a while and, you know, you're living in this dense city and you'd go for a walk and you'd walk through the forest for an hour or two and when you come out of the other end of the forest, there was this tunnel and you'd realise you'd been cured just by being surrounded by green and by, by the yeah. smell of nature and moisture. Yeah. And somehow nature is regenerative in what it does to you and I think we like to pick up on that in a few ways. So we can pick up on it how we frame nature, the elements of nature, and classical architecture does that if it's Chinese or Western. Um, and we like to make symbols of architecture. And then we like to learn um, uh, symbols of nature. And we like to learn principles from nature, like we've learned from seashells or seeds or other things Structural about Structural principles, yeah. Or, yeah. or as you were describing, systemic, you know, system yeah. um, principles. Right. Like that, from I mean, nature. that is really something I need, I need to get you guys talking about because, you know, I've done a bit of reading about biomimicry and yes. biomimetics and so forth and yeah. s and I think that I think you know just looking at it or responding to it anyway from the outside yeah. there's a sense of I get anyway a sense of rightness I go yeah this has to be right you know when you've got for instance structures like this which are very light and very strong yeah. and also very beautiful you know there's something incredibly uplifting about all that yeah. and um, I, I'm I'm sort of interested in how this move towards, towards not only towards you both as architects, but you working together as architects. Did I mean? Did you did you meet in Hong Kong and start talking about nature and go, yeah, yeah, that's what we want to do? Or how did all that happen? Not at all. I don't think so. We wrote this book together. It was more about the design process, asking, looking, playmaking, which was mm. uh, very much led by Mike. Mm. But at the end of that book, we just slotted in a, a very short page uh, called Glow, Grow, Flow, Float. Uh, and, and, that, and then we looked at it and thought, this is all about nature. And it was a kind of uh, post-rationalization almost. Mm -hmm. So there's something there. And then a few years later, we came back 
and we were teaching at the AA and we did some exploration with the students on seeds mm. and patterns in nature and patterns of human nature. Mm. So we were always sort of uh, drawn to it but didn't quite have the tools and maybe, maybe years later, you know, 15, 20 years later, we have much more sophisticated tools to do that, to, to actually really study nature and distill from nature these principles. Yes, okay. So, so I think we're getting to it, aren't we? I mean, did you start working together as architects before this whole sense that you could use nature in your work grew and did it, did it grow as, as the practice grew or? I think it, it grew over time. I think, uh, I think nature was always at the core of what we were interested in. And um, you know, I think when we first met, we just started talking about architecture, and the conversation never really finished. Yeah. And it's still ongoing, and it's a moving conversation, and yeah. it adapts and changes to our circumstance. But I think, as Anna said, we kind of look back and rationalise um, what we did and why we did it. We, did, we sometimes we we didn't consciously say we're going to frame nature, we're going to make symbols of nature, we're going to learn from nature. Yeah. Only after looking back we realised that's what we'd done. What do you mean by frame nature? So by framing nature, so in a lot of projects over so singing reading tree, um, it was a brief for a, a, an artwork on top of a hill, yeah. and we were told there were three sites and we could choose one, and we said what have they got in common? And uh, the competition um, um, organiser said well they're all really windy. So we said, well, which one's the windiest? And they said, Cram Point and Burnie. So we said, OK, we're off. Yeah. yeah, so this space, for instance, is framing the fall of the rain from the roof down that pipe and then into that tank. Yes, I noticed that which you've, got, um, you've got even uh, outlets here, haven't you? That's just a... Um, the lowest point of the pipe. That's a maintenance. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> to clean it's that It's like up. a Hot Wheels track, because we take the rainwater off the roof of a house, not off the green roof. Yeah. Cause um, the green roof's full of uh, nutrients and we don't want that in here yes. because actually the pond then is filled up by this. Right. So the water comes around this spout so every time it rains that starts flowing right. and it fills up that tank and then we press a button and that tank then fills this patio and it comes up through the gaps and makes a reflecting pool. And then underneath that tank are a series of lights that are super bright and thin and when it starts to rain, only when the raindrops bounce it illuminates them. So you make a sea of dancing beads of light. So we take rain, which most people in England have to put up with all the time, yeah. and we turn it into something really beautiful. Yeah. Like when the singing rain tree turns the wind into a beautiful sound. Here we turn rain into a beautiful pattern and a kind of engagement, like a fire. Yeah, so you frame it and you almost amplify it. Yes. It's also framing the light that's yes. falling, falling into this space. Yeah. And there are other things to frame, but it's not just framing, but really sort of almost Pumping up, pumping up the, that volume and engagement and that sensory experience of yes. nature. Yeah, emphasizing. Yeah, the sound, yeah. the texture, um, and, and you know, smell, touch. Yeah. <laughs> well, know. that's where the distillation is, and that's where the poetry is. Right. So you take one thing and you say, we're going to make this extension a really good place to be on a bad day. Yeah. Which is what Van Ruy said about architecture. He said in England, you need to make a building look good on a bad day. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we just took that to another level by saying, well, we can take the wind or we can take a raindrop or we can take the light. And architects really concentrate on light mainly. But those other, those other elements we also get for free. And so to use them, is, it makes complete sense. Yeah. There's so much delight to be brought in the falling rain. What you were just saying about, about this place, it, when you say it makes perfect sense, yeah. it makes perfect sense to you, yes. but it doesn't necessarily make perfect sense to you know, so yeah. many architects, to huge, huge traditions of architects, of people who just make boxes for people to live in. I mean, yes. there, are, there are quite a few things that, that when you were talking about that I wanted yes. to, to sort of pounce on. Yeah. Notably, your work with light, which I know is one of your, one yeah. of your big things, one of your tools, if you like. Yes. Um, but can we just, can we do the words bit, Mike? Sure. Because, you know, as I say, being a writer, I kind of, yes. I like talking yes. about words. And this is a yeah. storytelling thing. That's definitely a thing we have in common too. Yeah. Kind of Anna's background in you know, East Asian studies and poetry, and Anna reads so much um, Chinese and uh, poetry that um, you know, that's definitely in the core of her soul. And, um, and I think I'm just a kind of West Country storyteller. And, um, I guess we're interested in, in fables more than stories because architecture can be fables, and that means. Um, 
they're universally accessible, these stories, yes. but also locally very relevant, you know, has that takes on this kind of uh, specific character to do with that place and, and that group of people. What so is the difference between a fable and a story? I think a fable is much more primal, much more fundamental and can be, uh, you, you will see the, the same fable again and again, you know, like a kind of repeated pattern of yeah. whether it's human relationship or uh, symbols like mountains and flowers in I our might relationship. Be wrong, but my, my understanding, I mean, Aesop's fables, which I think... Who yeah, so fable, fables are all re related to animals. Yes. And parables are related to people. Right. And parables have a kind of um, moral objective. That but was so, cool. but so do fables. Yeah. So, which so one fables, is the one with the moral objective then? Uh, both of them have moral objective, oh, right. but one because of them is called... Because it ends up... <laughs> yeah, you know, so a fable, a fable has an animal in it nearly yeah, always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not generally a river or a mountain, you know, yeah. but it does make things... Um, it, it makes um, it personifies things. Yeah. So, um, so and it goes at the end, and the moral of the story. Is yes, yeah, exactly. So, so the just so stories are sort a, of. That's right. So yeah. sort of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't. Well. I didn't mean it in that way. I meant just uh, quite sort of strong, almost psychological patterns yes. in yeah. all of us. Yes. Uh, how we relate to, say, a tree or a mountain or a fox. Yes. Right. Okay. Well, those sort of allegorical stories. But basically a, a, a story telling you one thing but it's really telling you something else yeah so it has a kind of su a higher level and I think what we do with the story is we we make a parallel entity so that parallel entity is the design vehicle for us so if we tell a story to you about the spinning of the earth yeah. um, and then we make a tower of light you would go well how on earth are you gonna get there yeah but for us it becomes a kind of driver to abstract what our job is to make a flu tower for an energy center into something otherworldly. Okay. So that we're in a kind of free territory of abstraction that we can kind of bring inspiration out of. This might be the time to start talking about projects, mightn't it? I mean, since you have mentioned the Tower of Light. Maybe we could, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One more thing about nature, it just um, occurred to me, is the transformation. Because you, the theme being regeneration. Yeah. I think in a way, uh, nature also changes, you know. So for instance, these seeds here, it goes from this position to that because yes. it's got a job to do you know so right. it's not static and mm. architecture is all about transformation you take you know the the potential a project has and you turn it into something else mm. so that it, it no longer looks like that thing but it's it's uh completely fulfill its potential and yeah. that's what what we really enjoy doing and that i mean clearly as you say that's very much the story of nature isn't it yeah so where where should we go should we go to Storytelling? Yeah, let's do that. Should Should storytelling, if we go to storytelling, I'd, I'd say there's three things you have to do. So you have to go into the circumstances of, of, of nature in that particular place. You have to go into the people and who is it for yeah. and what are their objectives, what are their motives, why, why, what do they really want to achieve, what don't they understand they want to achieve that they really need. Yeah. And, um, and then the third thing is the place. And what is it special about the place that's so unique but it's different to everywhere else. So if you take nature, people, and place, those three are never the same. Yeah. And if you say that you're always going to be kind of true to the circumstances, then every project that you do is never going to be the same. They're all going to be different. Right. So it's not going to be like, oh, we do concrete projects or we do wood projects and we just do a different version of each one. Yeah. Um, it's basically, in each project, we start from nothing. And we look at who it is and we, you know, we really try to understand them and really trying to get underneath their skin. And if it's a company, we try to understand who the company is and yeah. what they what do. What the values yeah. are. Yeah, yeah. You were saying um, earlier that your process begins with words, not with drawing. Yes. So we do a word play at the beginning, and that's what we call asking. Okay. And we sit around a table. It's always done with a lot of people. And um, we, we take the subject apart. So almost everything falls into a kind of type. So you can, you can um, dissect a type. So, you know, this is an extension, and uh, the reason we remade what an extension is because we destroyed the extension in our minds and yeah. said... We take it we, apart. What is an extension? What should yeah. it do? Yeah. And yeah. it's also a sort of time perspective. We said, 
what is it now and what did it used to be in the ancient past yeah. Yeah. and what could it be in the future? You mean so what is the idea of the extension? That's the idea, What's the exactly. absolute ideal? Yeah. What could be the best thing you could get the, out the of an The core extension? idea of it. Yeah. Right. And so we made a really simple list of all the pragmatic things. Yeah. Like we want to sit and read a paper, we want to sit with friends, we want to have lunch here, we want to play ping pong, we want to have a barbecue, I want to have my tool shed, we want yeah. to have recycling. Where's your tool shed? So we made this amazing list of all the pragmatic things and all the poetic things. Yeah. And then we said, we don't want any of that pragmatic stuff, you know, we don't want any of it. Yeah. So we just put it all behind the cupboard. So it's all in here. This one's the best looking one. This is, <laughs> this is the tool shed, but it's full of motor. A bit here. messy. Oh, so, oh, fantastic. But it's the tool shed. But um, I mean, that, one, that one's the recycling, that one's the barbecue, and that one's the potting shed. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I mean, behind that black wall is the ping pong table. Very urban yeah. one. And, um, <laughs> so, so we just urban got garage. we got rid of all that stuff because yeah. you know you don't we didn't want to emphasise for pragmatic. We wanted to emphasise for poetic. Right. So. Um, Which you cannot do without being profoundly pragmatic. That's right. Yes, we right. yeah we had to kind of find a way of getting rid of what Position what, what that, we didn't yeah. really want to overemphasise. Yeah. So. Um, because that's yeah. another theme. I mean, I know we're bouncing from tree to tree, you yeah. know, but, but I, I quite like the way that this is working because we, you mentioned craftsmanship in, I think you mentioned it in when, when you're talking about families of parts. Oh, no, yes. consummate craftsmanship is the most from the least when yes. we're talking about efficiency and materials efficiency, process efficiency, all those things, yes. which, of course, you know, we see in nature. Craftsmanship is a is a big thing for me. I was a cabinet maker for ten years, so um, I wanted to know how it is that that mixes with, let's call it your poesy, your poetic side. You know, I mean, as you say, you've got all you've got all the things that you need this particular space to do, yeah. and then you decide to completely hide them. Yes. Well, in a way, yeah. what we're chasing is innovation. And um, we want each thing we do to be original to the specific circumstances of that place. So here, what could we do that has never been done before? And actually, because, as we explained, kind of illuminating a raindrop as it bounces and, and, and seeing those beads of light, we've never seen anybody do that. And it's really, when people see it, they're kind of bowled over. They're yeah. generally, it's, generally, it's like 10.30 and they've <laughs> had a glass or two, a red line. Mm. And when they see it, they're all like... Oh my God, it's so yeah. beautiful. No, you know, I can, I can it, feel that even without seeing <laughs> it. So I can feel that it you know, and then we then tried to say, well, how can we turn that into a piece of architecture? Yeah. So with the roof here, we'd cut the roof, and as Anna was saying, to cut, get, let the light in. But then this structure, so this, this looks like when, when you see it at night and you see the raindrops bouncing, mm. then this is a kind of microcosm of that. So these little lenses, which are kind of coffers, mm. um, actually have lights in. So the light's coming out of those coffers. So they're like the beads of rainwater bouncing mm. in the pond. Mm. But also as a structural system, um, it's, made, it's made like an aeroplane wing. So it's a stress skin and we've made lots of stress skins, but we've never made a coffered stress skin because normally a coffer takes load away. So if you imagine in the Pantheon, all of that stone's removed. Yeah. Actually, uh, it's just about um, removing mass. But here what the coffer does is it makes it stronger because it joins the top skin to the bottom skin and right. strengthens it like a knot in a tree. Right. But the strongest place on a bit of wood is the knot. Yes. When you put the saw through and you hit that knot, you go, damn, because yes. you didn't see it. And actually it's the hardest bit of a wood. Yes. So by here we make a knot and that knot is very, very strong and it binds the top to the bottom. And, um, and in between them is insulation. So this whole roof is supported on one tiny column which is 30 centimetres by 60 centimetres. So that's how the whole thing seems to float. So that's how we kind of make a kind of, because we used the walls, it was really logical, the walls were here. Yeah. So it was really logical, well, let's just use the walls. Yeah. And let's try and build something that goes around and, and puts the load into the logical place. In terms of the form, it was also really logical to take it from the highest point possible, yeah. from the back of the house to the highest point possible, the back wall. Right which gave us a natural catenary. Yeah. And then it sort of follows from there. But I think going back to your question about innovation and technology, it, the reason it gets somewhere interesting is because uh, it's led by a story, a story about rain, um, that uh, somehow makes it do different things. You yes. know? So for the singing rain tree, for instance, we work with uh, Mike Smith's studio and they had to invent a new uh, cutting piece in order to achieve 
how the wind is uh, sliced by the edge of the pipe. Right. Um, so that's you, this you is just for the singing, singing tree. Ring tree. Yeah. yeah. Singing ring tree. So it's yeah. by really sort of pursuing that um, story very doggedly that you, you get to this place of technical innovation. And is this where your craftsmanship comes in? Like you can't build this stuff without... No, I mean, I what I want to know is, do you do technical do knowledge? Hands? We do it all with our hands. So we use words, yeah. that, that's asking. We do looking, that's looking at nature, and we find the inspiration in nature. Yeah. And, um, and then playing is all about plasticine and paper. Right. And, um, and we don't draw, we make. Okay. You know, and through making and through that relationship of mind and hand and imagination, yeah. the three-way relationship, yeah. beautiful things come out of that. You know, if you have this abstract goal of like, how can I turn the rain into a roof? You know, yeah. or it's how can I turn the, kind of the wind into elusive a, 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 a wind-blown right. tree? Yeah. Or, so it's a very abstract way of thinking about something. But you got to have this instinct in your mind about this story that's mm. a parallel entity next to the, the pragmatics of, yeah. you know, how, yeah. how am I going to make it? But it's, that's always in your subconscious, and it comes out when you're making things with your hands. But that's not necessarily uh, us doing the joining of the timber together, but more sort of sculpting uh, models and so on. Okay. I think I'm understanding. <laughs> we can show you some <laughs> well, examples we, later. Yeah, we don't really know what we're going to make the project out of until we know its form. Yeah. So we never start with a material, that would be something we would never do. We always right. start with this blank sheet and we're only going to decide what the material is when we know what we want the form to be. Right. And when we, the form is telling a story, then we'll find the right way to make that story. Okay. And that's where the innovation happens in the making bit. But also in playing, you, uh, innovation isn't just about technical innovation, it's about social innovation, so it's about how you change a type. Yes. So how you change a human relationship or how you change a, you know, what is an extension. And we said, well, actually, you don't need a very big inside bit, but actually yeah. the outside bit's just as important. Yeah. And yeah. it's turned out to be, more, you spend far more time here and the staff have lunch here and mm. friends come and the we spend time here. The space here is yeah. so much more important than the enclosed space because yeah. I'm sitting here looking back along the, the whole length of the yes, uh, courtyard and looking at the house, you know, and, and my sense of space has been expanded. It's, uh, there's a lot of thought has gone into this, hasn't it? You well, know, it took us quite here. a lot of years. <laughs> <laughs> um, we need to, I mean, uh, time's yeah. marching sure. on. Yeah. My whole timing thing yeah. has gone completely haywire, so I've no You're idea where we're going to have to edit. <laughs> yeah. um, let's talk about projects. I mean, what do you want to talk about first? The, the Manchester Water Tower, this is a sort of model of it. Yes, yeah, so it's this is the Tower, of, Tower Light. of Light. The yeah. Tower of Light. So this was an international competition, and um, we were up against, f you know, four very good other architectural practices in Britain, and um, we knew we had to kind of tell a good story, and um, so we told them um, the sun doesn't rise in Manchester, Manchester spins towards the sun, mm. and um, rotation is the beginning of energy. And actually, the rotation of the globe um, in itself gives us the day, and the rotation around the sun gives us the seasons. Mm. And, um, and rotation gives us the kind of, uh, of the moon, gives us the change of the tide. So almost all the energy of the planet is related to rotation yeah. on a kind of universal level. Yeah. So we said, well, how can we turn rotation into energy? Or how can we kind of focus on that? And so we spent ages making models with pipe cleaners and plasticine of spring-like things that yeah. <laughs> were going to make this tower. Yeah. And um, Why did it have to be a tower? That because was brief. that was the brief, was to make a tower 40 metres tall to, to, to have some flues inside it okay. that came out of an energy centre. So it's an yeah. en energy centre with chimneys? Yes. yes. And you, you're essentially you're hiding the chimneys? Is that what you're and, doing? and supporting yes. it. Okay. Yes, the brief was actually for a shield. So they wanted you to just make a structure and put a shield on, but because we would never do that because we, were wanted, we wanted the structure to be the shield. Yes. So and in nature you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't kind of put up a frame and then clad it. Right. You know. Um, so what we ended up doing was making a structure out of very, very thin steel. So the whole tower, is, the curving steel is only six mil thick, yes. and there is no other structure. So, so that's, that's 40 metres high. Yeah. So that's like quite remarkable. It is remarkable. You know, so, uh, <laughs> so um, Arabs of the engineers, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, um, 
and the straight bit gets a little bit thicker at the bottom um, because they didn't need folding, yep. uh, bending. Um, but so it makes a very, very stiff, strong structure in exactly the same way a shell does because it uses undulation. Yep. But this is a technique called shell lace structure, which we invented, I don't know, 10 years ago? Right. Yeah. And that's a, that's a yeah. kind of core Biomimicry. theme of your work, yeah. isn't it? Shell yeah. lace structure. Is one of the, the, one of the core themes, yeah. It's mm. maybe about a quarter of what we do, because yeah. not every project suits this technique, yes. which is mm. about you know thin surface structure. Yeah. Uh, if you were building a house that needs insulation, maybe not. You know, we haven't actually tested that yet, but mm -hmm. we have designed a, a ferry terminal with it, with this mm. technique. We've tried this. This is things. the one in Kaohsiung, right? In Taiwan. In Taiwan. Yeah. And is that being built, or is it? No, it, it was that a was design a competition. competition. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but we never start with this technique. We always start with a blank canvas, and then if this technique is the right thing, then we'll utilize it. Okay. Um, okay. But it was all about us taking that kind of energy of the wind and yeah. you have to take it to the ground. So it's basically got a rotating pattern that you see here. And that rotating pattern takes this energy that's approaching it in this direction because that's the main load on it is the wind. Yes. And it brings it down to the ground and the main energy is then delivered to the ground in these vertical lines. Okay. So, so, I mean, yeah. does it, is, is there a, a practical function of, of kind of capturing that wind? I mean, for, it's an energy mm, sensor. Yeah. Right? So. We haven't, we're basically trying to resist the force of the wind of it being blown over, yeah. but to turn that um, energy of the wind into um, delight. delight. Inside them, um, inside we'll show you upstairs, there are these gold reflectors. Should but you, get you could do, yeah. Oh no, it's, 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 it's stuck to the balcony, oh, yeah. Right, right. So yeah. these gold reflectors, but the, the light comes through the perforation, because the perforation shows you how thin it is, yeah. and then the light bounces on the gold reflector, and then because they blow in the wind, they're quite thin, they, they do this, mm. they flutter, mm. so then the light starts to move in the tower. So when you look into the tower, there's all this, because the tower, the flues in the tower are very shiny stainless steel. Yeah. Um, so the whole thing's a bit like a kaleidoscope. So inside, um, when, when it's sunny and the wind's blowing, then light's going to sort of shimmer and move. And at night, the same thing's going to happen. We're going to shine lights on it. So, so it's called the Tower of Light because it's meant to be, it's meant to kind of not just glow, but it sort of moves. Capture and the light yeah. and, and make the light yeah. move yeah. and yeah. reflect. Sounds fabulous. It's an an animated uh, sculpture yeah. at the scale of the cities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, wow, that, I mean, you know, I looked at this in quite a lot of detail. Obviously, I hadn't kind yeah. of understood anything like. What else have we got that you want to talk about? The Swing Bridge. So we, we, we could. Um, well, that was well, another we really interesting, in. sure, sure. yeah, really interesting thing of the circumstance. So when we were teaching, um, Eleanor from the Natural History Museum, who's a, a shell morphologist, came along to help us. And um, at the end of one of the um, juries she was in, she said, oh, I'd like you to have a look at this bridge for me that leads to this little island with dinosaurs on it. And um, the dinosaurs were made 167 years ago at the Crystal Palace in South London. And uh, they're made of concrete and they're beautiful sculptures. And, um, They're extinct dinosaurs yeah. that, that uh, the Victorians decided to create sculptures from. And, and the significance of that was that it was the sort of de democratization of knowledge, scientific knowledge. Yeah. And hence, is there, you know, for slightly sort of dilapidated concrete sculptures, their they're grade one listed yeah. um, heritage assets. And Eleanor's uh, completely committed to making access possible so that people can maintain it, but also she wants to inspire people about them. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, we sort of uh, knew about this and because of our long-standing relationship with her for, for the sort of chalet structure, mm -hmm. uh, we, we helped her with the sort of crowdfunding and she succeeded in, in getting the mayor's fund initially and then she went to crowdfunding. So we had to do a scheme that was chalets, but then it moved towards uh, something much more uh, like a bony fish and more economical mm -hmm. and efficient to build. It was partly because the story led it away from that, because yeah. where the best place to put the bridge was um, the, the island is laid out in uh, evolutionary time, right. geologically and in terms of the evolution of dinosaurs. <laughs> and so the question was, well, what came before the dinosaur? And everyone knows it's the fish. 
Yeah. You know, it's the bony fish. Yeah. Because, you know, and it was the bony fish that went onto the land that became the dinosaur. Right. So we said, well, why don't we make a bridge that's more like a fish than a dinosaur? Mm. And why don't we make a... We didn't know how to make this bridge unpassable, and we didn't want to make a bridge with a gate, and we didn't want to make a bridge that was too complicated. So the logic was, well, just put the bridge in the middle of the water so no one can get to it, and then just make it turn. So all of a sudden it's like a fish, it stays in the water, and then you turn it when you need to open it. So that kind of led us to the form of a bridge. And then um, when we were looking at the gate, we'd, we'd do a lot of laser cutting, because these are all laser cut. Yeah. And we said, well, if you laser cut two pieces of steel like this, you can take this one and this one and you can use it. But we said, well, what if we take a piece of steel and we laser cut it like that? And then we can bend one up to be the balustrade mm. and one down to be the strut, mm. and one can go straight to become the deck. Yeah. So out of one piece of steel with no waste, it's incredibly cheap yeah. and it's highly efficient and it's yes. like something nature would come up with yeah. after a few million years. <laughs> <you know? laughs> but, um, but, um, so we used this comb technique, which has never been done before, but it's because we were trying to kind of make a bony fish. Yeah. We were chasing the sort of idea of a bony fish. So this story then leads you to technical innovation. So I think... Um, and then and that coincided yeah. with the economy of just using one sheet and, and not yeah. wasting I mean, it's any material. It's serendipitous, isn't it? Yeah. Like all the, all the ticks, all the boxes are ticked. Well, all the circumstances again mm. collide. I mean, the last thing is that when you look at the first fish, um, an elva or um, um, there's one called an akia, they move through the water like this. Yeah. And as they move through the water like that, they propel themselves forward. Mm. Well, that kind of undulating mode we use here, so that's a very strong device yeah. undulation. So we said, well, if you take that comb and you undulate it in plan, then if you have a balustrade and you push on the balustrade, generally the load's going down like this. Yeah. But if you have something that's pulling like this, then it can't go anywhere. Yeah. So all of a sudden you lock it. So like a bicycle wheel, you do that all the way along like this. Right. And all of a sudden you've got something super delicate and yeah. very, very, very strong. strong. Very and strong. It, with no extra material. Yeah. So by using the comb and the undulation together, we managed to make the whole bridge out of 10 mil steel. And, um, and it's again, spanning very, about very nine meters. Yeah. Very, very cost effective. What, what do the engineers who, who you work with say when you come up with this stuff? Uh, yes, do please. Yeah. <laughs> they <laughs> like it. Yeah. They, they love, it. They love yeah. it. Well, yeah. they love it. And they, they then go away and do the analysis. And we're constantly reanalyzing it. But actually, we, we explore it empirically because we make models of everything. Yeah. And we like push it backwards and forwards. And then they analyze it in the computer. Yeah. And sometimes the resu results are just the same. One of the really beautiful moments when we did the first shell lay structure with Arab, they came back and um, there was a little line of red on the model and they said the maximum stress is here. Mm. And we'd made the model and the model had broken at exactly, at the that, same, exactly that same point, you yeah. know. And it really was, you know, but, 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 but the parametric and analysis tools are so good now that the reality and, and, and digital are actually very well aligned. Yeah. And sometimes the reality is a bit more uh, innovative. It takes more risks, mm. uh, but it's proven. You know, it's right in front of you. So yeah. mm. I think sometimes uh, when you crunch the numbers, it, it tends to be a, a, a bit heavy, the structure. But yeah. so I, I think, you know. As long as there's poetry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think with, with crunching the numbers, you get a yes or a no. Yeah. But by making it, you get a yes and a no and a maybe, and a maybe. Mm, you, yeah. because it that's opens true. a potential. Mm. And actually, as you're doing it with your hand, you go, well, if I just did this, and that would solve the whole thing, but you wouldn't see that in a computer. Yeah. You know, it's because that mind-hand imagination relationship solves those problems, you yeah. know, so um, yeah. it's very empirically Which I think based. is craftsmanship, that's what Exactly, I yes, really yes. And that's where all of those traditions of, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, what would happen if we did this? Yeah. 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 Now, the water tower, I mean, is that completely different? It looks completely different to me. There's nothing shell lace about it, is there? No. Well, the staircase is yeah. doing a big job. Uh, so looking at the pictures yeah. of the staircase, I'm thinking, that looks incredibly heavy. You've built the staircase of block, right? Yeah, uh, wood, yeah. Uh, wood block. See, cross, cross laminated timber, yeah. Is it not very heavy? Yes, yeah, super heavy. For a good reason. <laughs> okay. okay, so the a water tank has so much water in it, yeah. it's equivalent to an eight-story building. And a water tank um, is fine to move around in the wind, but actually if you're going to put people in it and windows, it's no longer a good right. idea to move around. Yes. So you need to stabilise it. Yeah. And actually, there's an awful lot of, it's a steel water tank, so 
what we needed to do was use timber to stabilize the steel. So it sounds counterintuitive, yeah. but actually that's what we've done. So that staircase is built like a, if you look at a, um, a, a gastropod, it's a shell with a core in the center. Mm. That's called a compression spiral because you put any load onto it and it goes into the center. So, and if you look at um, Christopher Wren's uh, spiral staircase in St. Paul's Cathedral, that's a compression spiral and they cantilever out of the wall. So mm. if you put any load onto something, the, the, the load will go into the horizontal plane mm. and then it will start to move down. It wants to find the ground. Mm. So basically what we did is a compression spiral that takes the load to the ground. Right. From the yeah. tank, right. the floating yeah. tank. So yeah. we took the top of the tank and then the staircase goes to the bottom and, it's, and it makes it stiff. Okay. So, and it was Good very answer. cheap, very cheap to, <laughs> to stack the wood on top of each other. And it was really nice the way they went, you make it, you just, you put one and then it has a hole in the wall and you slot the next one in. Yeah. And, then, and then you put some screws in from underneath and then you put the next one in. I mean, someone's underneath going, mm -mm -mm, and the screw holes are already there. So they just go like that until they get to the top. Mm. And they just keep going in space until it's You would finished. have enjoyed making that, I think. Yeah. And the only thing about the, the other thing about the water tower is that uh, it, the water tower, you know, when we say it's all about the people, you know, that, this was for Dennis, who's a photographer, mm. and the whole way we cut the tank and what we did with the building was all about how we took him closer to nature. So yeah. the cut in the tank's all about, we want to see the horizon. You can see that, that yeah. panoramic Panoram view. Of the exactly, the yeah. tower's really dark, and when you get to the top, it's really light. Really light, You yeah. know, and the rooms under the tank, They've got one great big window and it just looks straight at this field of barley. Yeah. So when the field of barley blows in the wind, you just go, oh my God, that, that field of barley, that's so beautiful, yeah, you know. Yeah. Because yeah. that, so, so each it, one is a different yeah. experience of nature. So Every it's like space framed. again frames nature in a different yeah. way, in mm. different aspects. So it brings yeah. your attention to yeah. the north aspect or the, the sky um, or the sort of um, panoramic view. Mm. And it all does it in a way that makes Dennis happy because Dennis look, wants it to be grungy mm. and Dennis wants it to be raw mm. and he doesn't want any, anything to be slick or finished. Yeah. So Junjo uh, was a competition we won, mm. uh, invited competition we won. And here again, we question a lot about the brief. So it specifically said we want five towers three to be residential, one to be office, one to be hotel. So in the beginning we said, nah, why do you need five towers? Mm. Yeah, we sort Actually, of we took that apart. To design two, they said just the... You know, yeah, and leave yeah. the three residential yeah. towers. So we sort of questioned that, we tested different typologies of towers. We also looked at the surrounding landscapes for, the, for that kind of uh, visual inspiration. And we thought about the, in, in the asking bit, about what this place was. Zhengzhou was the cradle of Chinese civilization. It's mm. right smack in the middle of China. Mm. Um, and so that's sort of, you know, a, a series of different ideas or notions, I suppose, uh, came together. And we made a lot of plasticity models. Some, some of them were grids of smaller towers, and some were much bigger towers standing on their own. And eventually, we came back to this idea it's because it's so rare to get this kind of whole city block to do, yeah. you know, as yeah. an architect. It's such a rare opportunity. So let's just maximize that potential and create this kind of special space in the middle mm. with five towers. So mm -hmm. we connect them all, and then between them, we, it's almost like we make them join hands. Yes. And by doing so, you bring light into the core, you know, where it's the darkest, yeah. but you also create this sense of community. But also that poem that uh, there's a Chinese oh, saying yes, that uh, says, the city is square and the sky is round. Uh, is so that right? <laughs> Tian which applies to uh, life in many different levels. So the sky is round, the, the earth is square. Uh, it's a very strange saying, but mm. it also is, applies to how you deal with people. So meaning you are standing on earth and you have to be very strict with your own ethics, your, yeah. your contact. Yeah. But whereas the sky is where you interact with other people mm. and maybe with nature, you have to mm. be more rounded, which mm. means tolerant and um, open-minded. Yeah. And on a technical level, a lot of people make towers, you know, the shard is like this, but yes. the shard's made like a Christmas tree. It doesn't make any sense right. because it's got a great big core um, to hold it all up and then it's all cantilevered out from it. Yeah. But if you make a tower like this, then of course it's much stronger yeah. and you can put an awful lot less concrete in it because you take the loads to where they want to go. Right. And um, 
The other influence for us when we were in the looking stage was the Shaolin uh, mountains, mountains of air, yeah. and that's where yeah. the Shaolin monks come from. And those mountains are very tall and craggy, and they have these recesses in them, and the nature grows in the recesses. So we said, well, if you're going to make these tall towers, you can make cuts in them, yeah. because you, the plan's so deep, you can go into the plan, and then you can fill it with nature. Yeah. So the that's idea, right. we wanted to sort of take nature into the sky, but also then make this kind of round new world here. I mean, the whole thing then floated above That's the ground. A community garden. It was elevated yeah. like this yeah. ab above. But um, I suppose if you, you know, like Gaudi's experiments, he hung strings and then he turned them upside down. It's a strong form. Yeah. Um, in nature, there's a lot of example about uh, strong form and yeah. efficiency. And when you look at it, it just feels right. You know, so there's this sort of sense of proportion and, yeah. and delight when you look at the forms in nature. Fab. <laughs> We're going to have to stop. Okay, that <laughs> sounds much. good. Hey, hey. A good place to stop. I can tell you what, if I wanted a yeah. world, someone to build yeah. my world, I would yeah. definitely have <laughs> We'll build you a world, Aiden. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Tomorrow. <Thank you. laughs> yeah. Anna and Mike, wonderful, wonderful work and so inspiring. It's a real genuine pleasure. Thank you both very Thank much. You Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.